talking about how to achieve better schools and a better economy. We hid in the sand and hoped for a low turnout. Well, no party ever won the hearts and minds of our countrymen by hoping that fewer of them would take part in the democratic process. In this election, fewer did. Republican voters stayed home in droves. My dad used to say, faint heart ne'er one fair lady, nor any recent elections. <laughs> we are the party that champions individual liberty. Is that right? But with majorities in both houses, what did we undertake to protect individual freedom or to create opportunity to give meaning, fundamental Republican meaning to that freedom? Did we cut taxes or repeal unfair and costly regulations? Did we protect union members against having their paychecks ripped off by unfair union bosses to support politicians and causes that they in fact oppose? We did not. I think Barry would, in a few poignant and salty phrases, remind us that we'd better remember what we believe in and then act upon our beliefs. And we believe that in every American who dares to dream, there is a Baron Goldwater who deserves the chance to turn his dream into profit, living by a family credo of the best always. Barry understood much. He understood why it was important to limit government. As he said, if it's big enough to give it to you, it's big enough to take your freedom away. He understood that economic freedom was the kind of thing that his forebears fought for, that they understood to be essential to individual freedom. And he understood that the mirror image of that kind of freedom and all the rights that flowed from it was a duty, a duty to exercise personal responsibility. He knew very well that individual freedom is not real or honest, but only an empty promise without the educational empowerment that provides every child the kind of education, the kind of skills that are needed to compete and win in this information age. He knew it in part instinctively, but he knew it from his family history. Barry's grandfather immigrated to this country because, as a Jew, he was denied educational opportunity in his native Poland. They may be kidding themselves, but we cannot let the liberals kid us. When they deny the poor child trapped in a bad public school, the right to go to a better school, they are just as guilty of persecution, just as oppressive as the tyrannies from which our ancestors fled. As a people, as a matter of principle, we must demand school choice. In state after state, teachers unions have successfully resisted being held accountable for results. And the result is, that all over America, in one state after another, poor children deserving and in need of rescue from schools that are cheating them out of the quality ed education that every child should have and deserves are indeed being cheated of their potential to be all that they can be. There's one other lesson that Barry Goldwater provides. Never let your enemies define your agenda Never let them set your agenda. If they make the rules, you will lose. In 1964, this good, this decent, this caring man, who would personally fly soldiers home to Arizona for Christmas, was smeared as a madman with a trigger finger itching to rain down atomic destruction on little girls plucking daisies. Ugly. A generation later, the tactics are just as vile. In radio ads across Missouri, the state Democratic Party equated a vote for Republicans as a vote for more church burnings. In California, swastikas were spray painted on Republican billboards and lawn signs. 
My friends, the answer is not to get mad or get even. Lincoln, Reagan, Goldwater never, never resorted to gutter tactics. But neither did they suffer such attacks in silence, hoping for low turnout. They didn't turn the other cheek. They fought back. They did not allow themselves to be demonized. They spoke up for who they were and in what they believed. And so must we, and we will again, beginning in 2000. I think there is a hunger for the message that came from this great man that this great institute is continuing to keep alive. I know you want to hear from Tom Selleck. It even occurs to me that you may even prefer to look at Tom Selleck. I want you to know something though. When I started this job, I was Tom Selleck's height and I looked just like him. So let me conclude by telling you that I share the confidence of Barry Goldwater, who was never beaten, never allowed them to show a moment of sweat. Barry Goldwater said, we can win again. He said it after 1964, and he proved it four years later, and he proved it every damn day he was in the Senate. Let me tell you, he was a forceful senator. He was my chairman, and I am proud of it. He was a mentor. This is what he said to us in concluding his autobiography, which he entitled, appropriately enough, with no apologies. He said, if the people are told the truth about the dangers that we face, we may be blessed with a new president and a new majority in the Congress possessing the courage and the wisdom to take the necessary steps to save the republic. We can make that happen. And indeed, Barry Goldwater had the wisdom and the courage and did make that happen. With Ronald Reagan, they were so convincing to the other side that the Berlin Wall came down without our ever firing a shot. Now it's our turn. Tonight we remember Barry, we pay tribute to him and to his family. Beginning tomorrow, Let's resolve to honor his legacy by standing up for his principles and having the courage, as he did, to proclaim that we are conservatives, proud of this nation, confident that Republican practices and principles will create an America that he would be proud of, one of unfettered promise and prosperity and opportunity for all our children. Thank you, good night, and God bless America, and God bless the memory of Barry Goldwater. Thank you very much, Governor. Um, there is a parallel between the Goldwater Institute that, and Senator Goldwater that many of you may not be familiar with. We all know that Barry Goldwater did not win the presidency on his first try in 1964. But many of us deeply believe that Barry Goldwater did win the presidency with the election of Ronald Reagan. The Goldwater Institute is in some ways alike. Uh, the founders of the Goldwater Institute made one effort to found an institute before this one. And when that didn't turn out as they had hoped, they worked to found another Goldwater Institute. And that time, they succeeded. I mentioned earlier that in those days, they could meet in a phone booth. And I think some of them deserve recognition. It was indeed a small handful of committed revolutions. It included Terry Sarvis, Steve Twist, and Michael Block. When they concluded that effort and had begun in those first meetings, they turned immediately to our next guest, a gentleman who was truly there at the founding of the Goldwater Institute, and a gentleman who understands all of the principles enunciated by Governor Wilson, a gentleman who helped lead the fight to create the Goldwater Institute, uh, working with former State Representative Jim Skelly to get for the Goldwater Institute Senator Goldwater's name, 
a gentleman who has gone on to serve with distinction and to fight for the principles that Barry Goldwater believed in in the United States Senate and who was, at the day of his death, Senator Goldwater's United States Senator, my United States Senator, John Kyle. John. <clears throat> thank you to my United States Congressman. John, thank you very much. Uh, Governor Hull, Governor Wilson, and friends of the Goldwater Institute, it is an honor for Carol and me to be here this evening. Uh, and to Governor uh, Wilson, uh, I say amen. <clears throat> for, uh, and thank you for the exemption, by the way. <laughs> for, uh, for a decade now, as has been pointed out, the Goldwater Institute has been recommending public policy options to Arizonans with one underlying precept, the maximization of liberty. Barry Goldwater spent a lifetime pursuing that same principle. So it is entirely fitting that the Institute's work is performed in his name. In my remarks at the memorial for the Senator, I focused on this part of his legacy, his simple yet profound faith in human nature and the requirement of freedom to sustain it. You heard Margaret Thatcher in the video a moment ago say, when principles don't matter, human life itself is devalued. I'd like to borrow from those remarks of June 3rd. I suspect all of us remember the first time we met Barry. In my case, it was in May of 1961 when I was a student at the University of Arizona. And after working with him in the political arena for most of the ensuing years and after visiting with him often during his retirement, I think I know why he has had the influence that he's had. I've come to believe that in addition to the courage to which John Shadig uh, referred, it is because of his very unique perspective about nature, including human nature, it is why he could do without all of the political fault or all that preoccupies so many in public life. It's why he could shrug off his defeat in the presidential election of 1964, not because he didn't care, but because he knew in the end the most important thing was to tell the truth as he saw it and to build a foundation for the future. It is why he cared about and understood people so well and could shape a political philosophy which works precisely because it is predicated upon the true nature of man. That sense of perspective of what truly mattered was rooted in his early experiences traveling the state, rafting down the Grand Canyon, photographing Arizona's beautiful landscapes, and getting to know a lot of common people. He was very much a part of the land, of the desert, the mountains, the people, and the places of Arizona. And one reason I think he liked common people is because, like Abraham Lincoln, he saw himself as a common man. My, my father is the same way. They uniquely understood early on that every person has a specific, unique, individual worth, and that that is why freedom is indispensable to assure man's proper place in nature. As a young man, Barry Goldwater helped to run his family's trading post on the Navajo reservation. He knew the Hopi and the Navajo people, and he appreciated their way of life. He captured on film the character and the dignity of the Native Americans and other people. He saw their qualities as individuals, and he learned from them, and he respected them. Others wanted to remake human nature. Barry Goldwater appreciated it as it is. In that respect, he grasped the truth of the Founding Fathers, that freedom is indispensable for the fulfillment of God's purposes for those he created in his image. It was necessary to have someone of his courage and plain speaking to persuade others of this nature-driven view of liberty and smaller government at a time when it was not considered a very respectable view. 
But as Matthew Arnold said, the free thinking of one age is the common sense of the next. There is no doubt that Barry Goldwater, as the pathbreaker for today's common sense conservatism, is the most influential Arizonan of our lifetime, indeed, in the life of Arizona as a state. Summarizing his own life in 1988, he wrote, Freedom has been the watchword of my political life. I rose from a dusty little frontier town and preached freedom across the land all my days. It is democracy's ultimate power and assures its eventual triumph over communism. I believe in faith, hope, and charity, but none of these is possible without freedom. When I visited with Senator Goldwater in the last few years, he seemed reluctant to offer the specific political advice that I occasionally sought from him. He wanted instead to talk about the people he had known, about his early formative experiences in Arizona, and about history. There are too few people who give you the feeling that they have the long view in mind. Barry Goldwater did. And there can be no more fitting tribute to Senator Goldwater than the enduring work of this institute, which has and will do him proud. Thank you. Over the years, many of us have come to know and admire Senator Barry Goldwater's brother, Bob. We have delighted in his brilliant sense of humor and timing in paying tribute to Barry's good friend, Senator Paul Fannin, and most recently in his brilliantly humorous and emotionally moving eulogy at Senator Goldwater's funeral. We all know that Barry was famous for his incredibly direct responses and for his complete candor. But few of you probably recognize that that trait was, in fact, genetic. <laughs> Following Barry's nomination for the presidency in 1964, Bob and Barry's mother, Josephine, better known as Mum, was interviewed by ABC News here in Phoenix. When the reporter asked her, well, Mrs. Goldwater, aren't you proud that your son, Barry, is running for president? Mum shot back with classic Goldwater candor. Barry? They should have nominated Bob. He's the smart one. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to have as our special guest one of my favorite people, Bob Goldwater. Bob. Well, thank you, John. I wouldn't send this spot to the cleaners. <laughs> you know, after reading this morning's paper and seeing what those children wrote, six, sixth grade girl, you saw her up here. Hell, I haven't got anything more to say. I, I can't, I can't do any better than that, and, uh, and don't even aspire to. But it's not too hard for me to talk about Barry, because uh, uh, um, we grew up together, you know. And Barry didn't always want to become a politician. But he had a heart as big as the outdoors, and as he got into the business world and was running the store, and he got along so well with our employees because he was just one of them, and they all loved him, and he looked around the city, country, and he saw what other people were going through, and. Our people weren't because Barry was treating them right. And finally he came to me and Bill Softly, who you heard was the manager of the store. And he, he said, you know, you may think I'm seven kinds of a son of a bitch for doing this, but 
I don't like the way things are going in the in the country and somebody's got to you can't just stand there and talk about it if you aren't willing to go out and do it yourself why well, then shut up so he says I'm I'm going to try I'm gonna try to get into the Senate and see what I can do and lo and behold he made it <laughs> and about Two years later, I was playing golf with Eisenhower up in, in uh, Denver. And he says, uh, you Barry's brother? And I said, yeah. He says, I want you to know Barry stands out in that Senate like a thoroughbred amongst a bunch of balderdashes. Now, I've never known what a balderdash is, <laughs> but I did remember the name because Eisenhower said it, you know. <laughs> and when somebody like that talks to you, remember what the hell they said. <laughs> well, Barry did what he could, and he did a, he did a lot. But I, I've noticed in the last few years, one of the striking things about Barry was he believed in his principles. He believed they were right. And every day he was doing the same thing. He didn't have to go back and look at the newspapers and see what the polls said to decide the way he was going to vote. And unfortunately, today we have too many people doing that and too many newspapers telling them the wrong damn thing. You know? <laughs> That wouldn't have influenced Barry one way or the other. And I don't know. Pete Wilson had it right. Whatever he said, I've forgotten what he said, but I sure <laughs> agreed with it. <laughs> and Pete, you were a good man too. Wherever you are. <laughs> well, it's getting late. Hell, I should have been asleep a half hour ago. <laughs> and maybe I am. And thank you very much. Sir. Oh, I do want to say one more thing. Maybe, maybe, maybe this building, the Goldwater Institute, we should maybe just name it the Temple of Truth. Thank you very much. <laughs> what Bob didn't tell you is that when Barry communicated to him that he was running for the United States Senate, he actually wrote it in a letter, and he said in the letter, you may think me seven times a dirty bastard for running for Senate, but after all, it ain't for life. <laughs> of course, we all know it was for life, and America is better off because it was. Now for the moment that my wife's been waiting for. <laughs> 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 we are incre all incredibly fond of his work. He stands out uh, like a stallion uh, <laughs> in his chosen field. We are extremely for uh, fortunate to have as our special guest tonight uh, a man whom we admire not only for his work, but for sharing one of Senator Goldwater's defining characteristics, and that's courage. Uh, perhaps the most influential book Senator Goldwater ever wrote was The Conscience of a Conservative, 
Although it was only 123 pages long, it had a tremendous impact on the lives of millions of Americans and altered the course, I would suggest, of human history. The very first line in that book reads, I have been much concerned that so many people today with conservative instincts feel compelled to apologize for them, or if not to apologize directly, to qualify their commitment. Although our special guest has distinguished himself in a community where it takes immense courage to be a conservative because he understands the philosophy to which Senator Goldwater dedicated his life, he has never shied away from his outspoken commitment to conservatism. In Hollywood, those less courageous might have hidden their beliefs. But from his support for National Review to his commitment to dozens of other conservative cause, our guest has displayed that same courage that characterized Barry Goldwater. Please join me in welcoming a man who will never apologize for or qualify his commitment to the principles of Barry Goldwater, economic freedom, limited government, and individual responsibility. Mr. Tom Selleck. Thank you. Um, uh, thanks for asking me here. Uh, first of all, Governor Hall, I wasn't going to bring it up. But as long as you did, I, 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 don't, I haven't had a chance really publicly to thank Governor Wilson as the first chief executive before your term, Governor, uh, to support character counts. It wasn't politically correct then. He took a big risk, and I've always been really very grateful for it. Um, I never got to meet Senator Goldwater. I never met him, and it's one of my great regrets, but I think I understand him, and I think he would think I was remiss if I didn't share something with you. It's kind of five rules for living that, that I've tried to live by. And I don't want to sound pompous, but I will share them. The first one is never slap a man who chews tobacco. <laughs> You can write these down if you want. The second is never buy anything from someone who's out of breath. The third one is if you had everything you wanted, where would you put it? The fourth one, if you think the problem's bad now, just wait till the president solves it. You can substitute Congress if you want. Um, and the last one is the difference between genius and stupidity is genius has its limits. <laughs> yeah. uh, William F. Buckley said that people told me if I voted for Goldwater in 1964 that within a year we would be heavily involved in a war in Southeast Asia and have a severe economic crisis. And sure enough, I voted for Goldwater in 64, and within a year we were heavily involved in a war <laughs> in Southeast Asia and had a severe economic crisis. I guess 1964 was my uh, coming of age politically. Lyndon Johnson, the uh, liberal peace candidate, appeared to be Chicken Little promising that the sky would fall if you voted for the other guy. Well, I just kind of found that L LBJ's extremely nasty campaign was giving my embryonic political conscience a kind of itchy rash. And just as importantly, the other guy was the first Republican that I could remember who wasn't saying, I do too care. I'll just give you more of the same but less. <laughs> No, quite to the contrary, the other guy was offering a choice, not an echo. On October 27, 1964, Ronald Reagan burst on the political scene, as, as you saw in the video, saying that this election was about whether we believe in our capacity for self-government or whether we abandon the American Revolution and confess that a little intellectual elite, elite in a far distant capital can plan our lives for us better and then we can plan them ourselves. Now, I know you already heard those words, but it's my nickel, and I just wanted to say them once. <laughs> now, in my impetuous youth, it seemed to me that good government 
or making it more efficient, for I mean to reduce its size. I do not undertake to promote welfare, for I propose to extend freedom. Well, so there it was. It's a simple yet profound truth that there is a relationship between the size of government and individual liberty. Now, I was 18 and couldn't vote, but I was armed with my gold elephant lapel pin with the horn rim glasses, my AUH2O bumper sticker, and my 33 and a third long playing Barry Goldwater album. <laughs> And secure in the knowledge that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice, Hillary Clinton and I went to work for Barry Goldwater. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I've really heard that that's true about the First Lady. I don't know what to tell you. Um, all I can say is that if in her, heart, in her heart she knew he was right, what happened? <laughs> you know, she really worked for the senator that would mean the vast right-wing conspiracy is really vast. <laughs> well, for my part, you know, and I think it's because I, I feel I had extraordinary parents, I had come to realize that socialism and all its collective manifestations was in fact nothing more than a chain letter. The writer Flannery O'Connor wrote that you have to push as hard as the age that pushes against you. Now, while I don't believe in collective guilt, I, I am a child of the 60s, and my age was pushing very hard against me. So when confronted with, as Herb Gardner puts it in his wonderful play, A Thousand Clowns, when confronted with a philosophy of life somewhere to the left of Whoopi, I found my itchy LBJ rash was spreading. But Barry Goldwater was always there to help me scratch it. He was, in fact, the perfect tour guide for my political rite of passage. And later, when I moved on, quite accidentally, into the entertainment industry, that haven for compassion-obsessed, chain-letter-advocating demagogues, <laughs> Barry Goldwater was always there to remind me that I did not ha have to audition for human being for the privilege of rejecting the chain, letter, the chain letter. That I did not have to pass it on or risk dire consequences. Quite to the contrary, if I did pass it on, there would be dire consequences. And if a man is compassionate and decent and honest as Barry Goldwater could, as Bill Buckley put it, stand athwart history yelling stop, so could I. And just as importantly, if Barry, if Barry Goldwater, I'm a little nervous. <laughs> Just as importantly, if Barry Goldwater could stand that tall as a man, well, so should I. For it was the quality of his character, Barry Goldwater the man, that helped me to understand that one needed to have all the gratitude you can that you live in a country where you have the right to fail. That the pursuit of happiness doesn't guarantee you anything but the right to chase it. That life isn't fair, but that you can be. That line drives sometimes get caught and squibbers sometimes go for base hits. But the only way you can prove you're a good sport is to lose. He'd tell you that you may pay a price for your character, but one way or another, we all pay the price. Either we pay for our character or with our character. He helped me to understand that something is not proper simply because it is permissible, nor is it ethical simply because it is legal. And that everyone thinks they're ethical simply because we judge ourselves by our good intentions. But I think he would remind us that we are judged by our last worst act. Few of us are as good as we think we are, and none of us are as good as we can be. In the play A Thousand Clowns, Murray Burns is contemplating losing his nephew, Nick, to the government welfare people. It kind of reminds me of the senator. Murray says, I just want him to stay with me till I can be sure he won't turn into Norman nothing. I want to be sure he'll know when he's chickening out on himself. I want him to get to know exactly the special thing he is, or else he won't realize it. 
when it starts to go. I want them to stay awake and know who the phonies are. I want them to know how to holler and put up an argument. I want a little guts to show before I can let him go. I want to be sure he sees all the wild possibilities. I want him to know it's worth all the trouble just to give the world a little goosing when you get the chance. And I want him to know the subtle, sneaky, important reason that he was born a human being and not a chair. Uh, two weeks before the 64 election, I think it's enormously appropriate on Veterans Day, Ronald Reagan recalled an ex-GI telling how he met Barry Goldwater. He was a Korean War GI, and it, it was the week before Christmas. And during the Korean War, he was at the Los Angeles airport trying to get a ride home to Arizona for Christmas. And he said a lot of servicemen were there, and there were no seats available on the planes. And then a voice came over the loudspeaker and said, any men in uniform wanting a ride to Arizona, go to runway such and such. And, and they went down there. And there was this fellow named Barry Goldwater sitting in his plane. And every day in those weeks before Christmas, all day long, he'd load up the plane, fly it to Arizona, and fly them to their homes, and fly back and get another load. Well, like those Korean War GIs, I'd just like to say, thanks for the ride, Barry. And thank you very much. It was worth the wait. <laughs> this is the fifth year that we have presented the Goldwater Award. The Goldwater Award is presented annually to the individual who exemplifies the principles of limited government, economic freedom, and individual responsibility. Those receiving the award in prior years have been Jack Kemp, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, William F. Buckley Jr., and Milton Friedman. During his lifetime, Senator Goldwater would not allow us to present the award to him, so we had to wait until now. I'd like the Goldwater family members who are here with us tonight to join Susan and Bob on the stand up here to accept this award on behalf of Senator Goldwater. I'd like our special guest, Tom Selleck, to join our chairman in making the formal presentation of the Goldwater Award to the Goldwater family. The Goldwater family has asked that the award be received by Bob Carolyn and Susan Goldwater, if they'd please join me now on the podium. You. Him. You. Him. Where is Carolyn? Where is Carolyn? She's over in the corner. <laughs> Caroline? Oh. <laughs> that wasn't scripted. Met the can. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the Institute, we, uh, you need to, uh, we should do that up here. On behalf of the Institute, we are most honored to present this award to Barry Goldwater and to you, the family of Barry Goldwater, Susan and Bob Goldwater. Everybody saw Tom Selleck give me a kiss on the cheek. All you women, eat your hearts out. <laughs> Thank you. The uh, most famous words of Goldwater, Senator Goldwater's life have been recited here a couple of times tonight. Extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. Moderation in pursuit of justice is no virtue. Although often attributed to others, they were in fact written by Professor Harry Jaffa, who now teaches at Claremont Institute uh, and uh, is involved in, in the, teaches at Claremont College and is involved in Claremont Institute, which is dedicated to freedom and natural law. 
At the time of the quote, it was very, very controversial. Senator Goldwater was being attacked across the country as an extremist. And in fact, immediately following the speech, Senator Goldwater received a telephone call from Dwight David Eisenhower. The president, the former president, demanded that Barry appear the next day at the Fremont Hotel in San Francisco and explain what he meant by the speech. When Barry arrived, Ike had read the morning papers and they had been stinging in their criticism. Ike was angry and worried. Barry looked him straight in the eye and said, Mr. President, when you landed your troops at Normandy, it was an exceedingly extreme action taken because you were committed to freedom. Ike paused, grinned, and said to Barry, I never thought of it that way. In his most recent movie, Saving Private Ryan, former Phoenician Steven Spielberg poignantly reminds us that at times in our nation's history, extremism in defense of liberty has been essential. And viewed from today, few among us would argue that moderation in pursuit of justice is a virtue. I want to thank you all for having joined us for this very, very special evening. And I'd like to conclude with the way Barry Goldwater said he would like to be remembered as an honest man who tried. God bless you all. Good night, and thank you for being with us.